Good evening. Thank you. My name is Marty West, and it's my privilege tonight to welcome you to the Ask With Forum on being and becoming an education leader. The Ask With Forums are a series of public lectures that bring together the best minds in the field of education to share their knowledge, engage in spirited conversation, and generate new insight into the highest priority challenges facing education. And tonight's event will be no exception. There are few more pressing issues facing the American education sector than ensuring that there is an adequate supply of effective leaders. The Council of Great City Schools recently reported that on average, the current superintendents of the nation's largest school systems have been in their jobs just 3.2 years. An April 2014 EdFuel report projects that by 2023, the sector will need to fill 33,000 new senior and mid-level system leadership roles in the nation's largest, uh, 50 largest cities alone. Meanwhile, U.S. public schools must hire nearly 12,000 principals annually to fill vacancies due to staff turnover and retirement. Yes, it's classroom teachers who have the most direct impact on student learning, but it is the individuals in leadership roles at both the school and system level who create the conditions that enable teachers and ultimately students to reach their full potential. Yet if leadership is important, it's also notoriously hard to pin down. Some are skeptical of the ability of research to define the attributes, knowledge, and skills that effective leadership requires. Others would argue that what it takes to be a leader depends heavily on the context. Even if absolute certainty is elusive, however, continually updating and refining our understanding of the demands of leadership is essential to inform the recruitment and development of new leaders and the organizations engaged in that task. Organizations like our own school leadership program, our programs in professional education, and the doctorate in education leadership. So tonight's panel is intended to help us at Harvard and hopefully the field in this task. We've assembled a stellar lineup of education leaders to reflect on what made them effective and its implications for the preparation of the next generation of talent. Hence the title, Being and Becoming an Education Leader. The members of the panel vary widely in background and perspective on education reform but they share one thing in common, a track record of results. So we hope that the conversation will be useful to both aspiring leaders and to those engaged in leadership development. I should also note that in the audience tonight and here in Cambridge are many of the participants in a convening on education leadership that the Harvard Graduate School of Education is hosting tomorrow along with the Walton Family Foundation. And so we're grateful to them for being here as well as to Carrie Walton Penner and Mark Sternberg from the foundation for their generous support of tomorrow's event. Now our panel tonight will be moderated by Stacy Childress, the CEO of New Schools Venture Fund. And prior to joining New Schools, Stacy uh, led the K-12 Next Generation Learning Team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, investing in schools and technologies that support personalized learning for middle and high school students. And before that, Stacy was on the faculty here at the Harvard Business School where she wrote and taught on educational entrepreneurship and most importantly, where she made critical contributions to the development of our then fledgling doctorate in education leadership. Stacy is a graduate of Baylor University and the Harvard Business School. And I'm also pleased to say from experience that she's a moderator who never hesitates to ask tough questions, just what you need on a panel like tonight's. I'm especially pleased to say that because I am about to take a seat. <laughs> Last thing I need to tell you is that Having recently succumbed to peer pressure from our Dean Jim Ryan and joined Twitter, uh, I need to let you know that we'll be tweeting about tonight's event at the hashtag uh, AskWith. So I encourage you to use that if you're interested in engaging with tonight's forum, both in person and online. So thank you, and I'll hand it over to Stacy to introduce the rest of the panel. Hi, everyone. Hi. It's good to see you all. Um, let me run down the list here of our panelists. We've got an amazing group um, to discuss with each other tonight uh, about being and becoming an education leader, and hopefully to discuss with you some. Um, we're going to um, have a bit of a moderated conversation here 
for a little while and then maybe earlier than you might normally be used to actually take a couple of questions from the audience. So you should be thinking through the first you know, 20 minutes or so of our conversation um, what questions it sparks for you uh, and be ready to, to ask them when notified. Take a couple of questions from the audience and then move back into moderated conversation. So we're gonna try to move back and forth a little bit. If it turns out it's not working, we won't do it anymore. We'll just uh, stay in conversation here and then do questions at the end. But we're gonna give that, we're gonna give that a shot. So let me tell you a little bit about these amazing folks uh, who probably don't need too much of an introduction uh, for a group like this, but um, it's worth just giving you a couple of highlights. Uh, Norman Atkins, just to my left here, is the co-founder and president of uh, the Relay Graduate School of Education. Uh, it's a groundbreaking institution. It trains more than 1,300 public school teachers and principals across the country every year, and in some ways is a bit of a competitor to this august uh, institution with a new uh, breakthrough model. Before that, um, I think what some people forget about Norman sometimes is that he was a co-founder of Uncommon Schools, uh, which is one of the early charter management organizations here on the East Coast and one of the highest performing and a very interesting model that isn't trying to replicate over and over the same school model but create an umbrella within which school leaders' creativity uh, and school communities' creativity can create terrific schools under the same, uh, under the same brand. He was at Robin Hood Foundation in New York uh, for a while before that um, and uh, also one of my favorite things on his bio is that he's uh, also helping start uh, an education technology company in the midst of all of these other responsibilities he has. So a company called Zern that's creating exemplary math content um, for, uh, for the K-12 space. So you should look up, look up Zern. So Norman, it's great to have you. Uh, Carl Cohn on the end down there. Um, many of us know Carl Cohn from his long tenure as a superintendent in Long Beach um, Unified School District for a decade, from 1992 to 2002. Many case studies written uh, on Carl's tenure, but he did a lot of things before that and a lot of things after that. He was also the superintendent in San Diego Unified School District after Long Beach. Uh, he's taught at um, the University of Southern California. He uh, has long been on advisory committees here at the Harvard Ed School for Leadership Development Programs uh, and is currently the director of the Urban Leadership Program and a professor in the School of Education at Claremont Graduate School of University in California. Uh, while Carl was the superintendent in Long Beach, in addition to all those great case studies and good results for kids, uh, Long Beach did win the Broad Prize in 2003 uh, for the progress they were making, both in terms of overall uh, achievement and in closing the achievement gap. So Carl, it's great to have you here uh, as well. Um, Pete Gorman, next to Carl. Uh, Pete, known to many of us from his tenure at the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Schools as the superintendent, very high performing um, tenure there. Um, he started as a teacher in Orlando, Florida, second grade, I think, uh, Pete, which is, which is terrific. He's a teacher, a principal, district level administrator. Um, he uh, also, under his leadership, won the Broad Prize there in Charlotte. So a couple of Broad Prize winning superintendents on the panel. Um, and currently, Pete is the Executive Vice President of Education Services for Amplify, um, uh, an education um, content and technology company, and he leads the company's government relations, marketing, and sales work. And last but certainly not least is Irma Zardoya, who many of you also know. She's had many roles in the New York City uh, public school system. Uh, she also was uh, a, a principal and a teacher, but led citywide implementation of the inquiry process where teachers working together to improve um, their school. She's worked with large popula populations of English language learners um, and uh, worked hard to identify their special needs. She's on Governor Cuomo's New York State uh, Education Reform Commission, uh, was a superintendent in the district, both in Region 1 and in uh, District 10. Uh, so lots of on-the-ground leadership responsibilities herself for, for a number of years, and currently is the president and CEO of New York City's Leadership Academy, um, which is now a national organization focused on the development of high-quality school leadership uh, programs. So this is our terrific panel. Let's welcome them one more time. And then...
So I, I'm, we're going to attempt not to have every panelist answer every question, which can get a little redundant um, in a format like this. But we do want everybody to respond to the first question, even though I know you're resistant to it, uh, <laughs> panelists. Please respond to the first question, um, which really um, uh, wants you to think from a prioritization standpoint. Like, what do you think um, in your tenure as leader is the most important thing, the one most important thing you learned on the job that you did not know from your preparation programs, your training program, your prior kind of experience in um, lower levels of the organization. So once you were a kind of a system level leader, what's the biggest thing you think you learned that you didn't learn in your prep program and maybe you wish you had <laughs> learned in your prep program? So Irma, I'm gonna start with you. Oh, thanks. It's okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, I, it's okay, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> So um, I, I gave this a lot of thought, and of course I learned a lot, and the part around instructional leadership was really high um, up there. But I decided to talk a little bit about collaboration, and because of the power of collaboration, and especially uh, collaboration for decision making, and then collaboration for learning. Um, as a teacher, uh, as a lead, lead teacher, I realized that my principal was very smart when he actually brought together a group of teachers and, and parents and administrators to really help him think through goals for the school, how to make decisions around uh, the resources that were available, and how to sort of chart the course and, 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 and actually plan a strategic uh, process for uh, the school improvement. Um, what I realized then and what I carried with me was that I developed a sense of ownership around and a sense of accountability for the work within that school because I had a very vested interest because my voice had been heard and I had been a part of that decision-making process. Um, as a district superintendent um, and as I went through a pr my principalship, obviously I modeled that in my school and was able to um, really create a community of individuals, of teachers and parents that really were very vested in the success of the school. As a district superintendent, it was really interesting because um, two months into the job of District 10 superintendency, I actually took a risk and I decided to bring together 100 people. They were uh, parents, teachers, administrators, custodial custodians, um, community-based organizations, and we all sat in a room. It was a district that had been fractured by a lot of infighting, et cetera, and it was my opportunity to bring school board members also into that group and begin to envision what we wanted for the district, what did we want collectively, and everyone's voice, uh, everyone had an opportunity for their voice to be heard and for them to help craft a collective vision for the next five years for the district. In fact, it was a, a wonderful entry point into, um, into the district and into the work that ensued afterwards. Um, throughout my career, there was also part of the collaboration for learning, which I learned as a, as a principal how important it was to engage teachers to work with each other and to help each other and to inform their thinking and their planning. As a district superintendent, setting up those structures that was so important for learning and collaboration. Um, but it was when I was at the central office, at New York City central office, working um, to develop leader, uh, teacher teams across the city, uh, engaged in collaborative inquiry, that the power of collaboration really, uh, the power of learning and, co and collaborative decision making came together. Because as teachers learned, um, as teachers gave feedback to one another, as principals got engaged in that process also, what we found was that um, not only were teachers making decisions around their practice, uh, what to change, um, what to uh, think about, but they were also helping to inform decisions at a school level, at an organizational level. And they were helping to create, uh, the principal created opportunities for them to help inform the change in curriculum, um, the use of resources, um, 
I mean, it just became a very, very profound way of bringing together this notion of collaboration, but how collaboration can also support learning and decision making. So it sounds like, Irma, the thing that you learned, you understood collaboration was important yes. on very specific things. But the leadership insight, once you got to the system level, was it actually has a broader or wider lens. impact and lens yeah. than you might have realized at the specific um, exactly. school level or teacher group exactly. level. Exactly. And, yes. and, and how deliberate you need to be in setting mm. up those opportunities for individuals to come together and mm. collaborate and how open as a leader you need to be able to share the power. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really part of what I got as feedback from teachers and principals was how it had transformed um, the sense of accountability and ownership, but had also transformed how the conversations that they were having around student learning, um, and that they were very focused on the improvement, especially around students that historically were underserved, they weren't able to crack um, the nut around how do we get to this group of students, but that they really focused in on um, real dilemmas in their schools, they problem solve them, they change their practice, and then they started thinking about, well, what's the implication of this for the entire what else work can that we do? we do? Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Carl? The one thing you learned that you wish you would have known or that you didn't know when sure. you went in? As a first year <coughs> superintendent, I thought that unions and teachers were pretty monolithic in their views. So I got into this discussion with the president of the teachers union about what teachers thought. And he said, no, they don't think that. And I said, well, I think they do. <laughs> so he says, okay, why don't we go to a school and listen to teachers together in order to figure this out? So I said, fine, we'll go. And then I thought, you know what, you're being set up. <laughs> you're going to go out there, he's going to step aside, and they're going to wail on you. So we go to Long Beach Millican High School, fairly suburban part of the district, crusty high school, contrarian faculty with a lot of social studies teachers who think baiting the superintendent <laughs> would be fun. Everybody, everybody gets, um, they come on conference periods. So they're all there, and I'm getting ready to get wailed on. And what actually happened was, by snack time, I'm feeling sorry for the president of the union. They are beating up on him. The district, the union isn't aggressive enough in getting a retirement incentive program. We didn't like who CTA supported, California Teachers Association in the last election. I'm thinking, my God, they're showing in front of me, they're showing all this disagreement, really changed my view of what was possible. The, the other interesting thing that happened in this kind of exchange, it, it started my path on the superintendency, so it ended up over three different union presidents, the superintendent of schools and the teacher union president visiting schools together and listening to teachers. And it completely changed the dynamic with regard to collective bargaining. One of the things that the union found out that they didn't know was that when you actually visit schools with the superintendent, everybody shows up. So normally, <laughs> when you just go out there at lunchtime and listen to a small group of whiners and complainers, you don't really, as an organization, get the big feedback from your membership. So this started a 10-year process of visiting uh, schools, superintendent and teacher union president together, and it really changed the course of labor relations mm -hmm. in Long Beach. Yeah, it's great. Pete. Well, thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I've been out of the superintendency now. This is my fourth year, and one of the things I have to stay uh, constantly aware of is remembering just how hard it was, because you tend to think back, and, oh, it was all doable, and we did all this great work, and you forget moments that weren't. And um, 
you also forget, you have to make sure that you talk about the context of the moment when you were there and also point out the great work that had been done in the district before you got there. I, I walked into a fabulous situation in Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. A lot of really good work had been done by very bright people, great teachers, great principals, great leadership team. And when I went to Charlotte, I had been a superintendent for six years in Southern California before that. So I thought I knew the work. And the area I was least prepared for was the outward facing portions of the job. The board, the press, politics, community-related things, and I dealt with those in Southern California. We had a district about, I don't know, about 25,000. Carl came and visited me a couple times when I was out there. It was kind of a nice situation, but it didn't prepare me for what I would be dealing with in Charlotte. And what I learned was I had to work very hard to make sure then I brought our senior leadership team in and let them experience those opportunities and participate, A, to bring their great intelligence to help me work through and traverse those areas, but also to prepare them. Our whole cabinet ended up going on and being superintendents of large urban districts. So we had a pretty good situation with that and bright, bright people, but we had to prepare them for that and make sure that they were ready because there were moments where it was rocky. And at times, too, I had to learn that while I wanted to be incredibly focused on things inward, the teaching and learning pieces, if I didn't do some of the outward facing things, I couldn't create, I had to create space so we could do some of those other things that were more important, such as teaching and learning and leadership development and those other areas. And at times it created an environment where I was doing work I didn't want to do. I thought, this is not why I became a superintendent. What the hell am I doing this for? <laughs> and in the end, I learned that you can do both pieces. It's harder. It is not as um, satisfying in some ways. But it is the right work to do, and you need to open up and let others experience those opportunities. And um, also, uh, going through that process, I got to learn more about our community in general because I had to work with our team and say, this is what I'm getting bombarded with, with facing outward. You take me to places to hear other opinions and other things. And it really helped me see another side of the district. So that's the area I wasn't really prepared hmm. for when I went to Charlotte. And it sounds like you built those opportunities in for your earlier career staff that were along with you so that they could start to develop that we skill did. themselves. We yeah. did, and, and I did it for two reasons. One, to help them, and the second, just kind of, self, I wanted their brains to help me yeah. Yeah, figure my way Yeah, to get some extension it. yourself, yeah. Yes. So Norman, how do you respond to this one? The one thing you didn't know going in that you learned on the job as a leader? Um, good intentions aren't enough. I, I, I thought um, you just um, love your way into this. You hire a bunch of great people. Um, and, you set, and you set them loose. You give them autonomy and um, build a really positive culture and great things are going to happen. And um, if we turn our attention away from uh, the kind of charisma or gifts of the teacher and look at what the experience is of the students um, and what happens to the students, um, we have to, as an entire sector, be incredibly dissatisfied with just about everything that we're doing. Um, and so the, the one thing that I've noticed uh, the most when I go around um, and see schools, um, when I go into classrooms is, um, you know, uh, Marty mentioned um, the statistic that the average superintendent, urban superintendent's in a job for three years. It's a really hard job. The statistic that blows my mind is the average principal in the United States spends six minutes a day observing and giving feedback to teachers. Six minutes a day. That means that our principals, the people who are leading our schools, our education leaders, um, are uh, managing buildings and not leading instruction. And yet when I go and observe um, 
teachers making progress, it's not because they're born great. It's not because of great teacher prep programs like ours. It's not because um, only of great curriculum, um, although all those things are important. It is the speed of the observation feedback loop. The best um, results are happening when principals spend 40% of their day going into classrooms, observing and giving feedback uh, to teachers. And when their eyes are cast not only on um, what teachers are doing at the front of the room, but what is happening at the students when they're peering over the desks and looking at how students are learning and experiencing <coughs> the, the lessons. Mm. Uh, the six minute a day st stat um, is draw it's a jarring one. Um, and you know, probably also leads to a lot of the frustration among principals, which is you know, the time they wish they had to do those kinds of um, observations, feedback for teachers, and instead are spending their times on, time on lots of other, other things. Um, let me so I have, I have a general leadership question, right? So this could be asked of leaders in any um, sector. You can feel free to put a little bit of an education spin on it, but I want you to stay somewhat general. Um, I think oftentimes when people aspire to leadership, they understand that a, a piece of being a leader is making decisions and helping people get mobilized uh, to action around those decisions and have lots of you know, theories of doing it collaboratively versus, uh, versus a little more um, in isolation. But I think the, the thing I know I uh, learned as a leader, er, leader early on is um, the thing that's hard about decision making is it's almost never a choice between a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> or a clear path versus you know, a path to destruction. It's almost always a lot more nuanced than that and um, that the options we face as leaders are often between one less than ideal scenario and another less than ideal than scenario that we're trying to piece together on the way to some really great result uh, for kids or, or, or for adults. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering about you know, how you experience that as a leader how you think through making those decisions between suboptimal choices, how you get people mobilized around them, um, and then reflect a little bit on, is it actually possible in preparation programs to give aspiring leaders the kinds of experience and mindsets they need to think through those kind of um, moments, or do they just have to learn that on the job? Carl, I'd love for you to start that one for us, because sure. I know this is uh, yeah. often what you had to think through in Long Beach. So in the late 80s, Long Beach was this gritty port city. It had become immigration central in 1980. The New York Times actually sent <coughs> Seth Midans, who was one of their award-winning reporters, to cover the gang violence in Long Beach between Latinos and Cambodians. We had had an elementary school bus uh, that got caught in the crossfire, and it was only an alert bus driver who got the kids on the floor of the bus that kept the youngsters from being shot. These older age gangbangers shooting at each other. Uh, and so we decided this is a real crisis. Um, the perfect solution would have been to rid Long Beach of gangs. We decided, you know what, we're not that powerful, we're not gonna do that. But what we can do is provide safe schools free of gang influences. And that started us on a path to, I was asked to put together the gang task force. At the time, I was the director of attendance, soon to become an area superintendent. And so that required us to roll up our sleeves, to go to work with law enforcement, to do all of those things that my doctorate at UCLA hadn't really prepared me for. Um, so I spent most days in jeans, t-shirt, windbreaker, and walkie-talkie collecting gang intelligence, hired a bunch of people, who actually uh, had worked in gangs, knew and understood gangs, spent an incredible amount of time with law enforcement exchanging intelligence, and the whole idea was to create safe passage 
for our youngest uh, students. And that then launched us when I became superintendent, school uniforms, a whole host of symbols that suggested that these were school children and that they ought to be given safe passage on the relatively mean streets of, of Long Beach. So not a perfect solution, but one that was in our sphere of influence. I think it is the type of thing um, that people can learn. Um, I was a huge fan of the urban superintendent program here at Harvard that actually put people uh, shadowing an urban superintendent for six months. And I mean, you literally lived with that person and you debriefed with them. So I think these things can be taught, but it, it has to be the right kind of um, internship type experience where you're actually sitting there and um, you know talking with the people from the gang task force who are 100 percent focused on the protection of kids yeah. so up close and personal yep. uh, to seeing a leader or a set of leaders make those decisions over and over over norman i know you all have a principal training program um, how, uh, how do you guys think about this in terms of preparation, um, making, help, helping people understand how to make trade-offs between you know, things that either aren't clear or that clearly are not uh, optimal? So I like the, I like the idea of shadowing. Um, that's, a, that's really useful. But um, unless you're in the experience of practicing, it's very hard to get good at something. Yeah. And so uh, it helps to both uh, have opportunities to rehearse um, um, in, in a setting, and we try to set up a lot of opportunities for people to rehearse, and then you also need to go and start doing that work uh, in the field and get feedback on how you're doing. I think with respect to decision making, especially when you're talking about stuff that's so freaking complicated, like uh, what you just described, Carl, that you need to kind of narrow the field for people. You need to like create opportunities for people to do responsibly and well things that they can do in, in, a, in, a, in a habitual way. And if you can do that for like 90% of the work, then this, it opens up the space, the 10% of the space for creativity and problem solving and allows people to go and uh, to make decisions inside of that space. Mm -hmm. And I, the only thing I would add is that you, um, you want to rehearse your, um, your responses to those particular um, situations. So uh, when faced with a, with, with a big decision, you want to get together with other people and uh, go through all the different scenarios and, pl and play it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pete. We, we had a scenario in Charlotte where um, a little over two thirds of the students who were performing below grade level were in about one third of our schools. Charlotte is, is Charlotte Mecklenburg, it's a countywide district. So it's really two districts. It's a large urban and a large uh, suburban, kind of all combined into one. And one of the things we talked about was, well, we've got a unique opportunity to try to do some things with some of those uh, opportunities that we have. And um, our first scenario we thought of is, well, if those schools are struggling, why is it? Do we have our finest principals there? Do we have our finest teachers there? Are we allocating resources to meet the needs of the students there? And our first thought was, well, if we don't have that, we need to just grow the pool. And our reality was we couldn't grow the pool fast enough to deal with those issues. So we had to make some decisions because what we ended up finding was we went out and talked to teachers. And we said, our, our best teacher, why aren't you in those schools? And they gave us some really good answers. They said, I don't live near there. I don't shop near there. My child care's not in there. When I came into the district, I started there. That was my port of entry because they were the only teaching jobs that were open. But after time, I went out to a suburban school. And we found the same things with our principals. So they sharpened their sword in the urban environments where we had our most challenging situations, and as they got more skillful and progressed, they moved to other areas. So we had to make some decisions for what were we going to do, and we worked with a, a woman, I, th I think, uh, 
uh, Tom, I think you may know her, Justine Hastings, she's an economist. She, she said, well, yeah, uh, some people are going to tell you, J just push people in there. And she said, you know, there's these kind of rules about labor pools that you don't really push people into jobs and have performance be where you want it and some other things. You've got to find ways to get people to go to those places. So we started that process and we sat down with teachers and principals and said, what would it take to go? And we came up with some scenarios that got people to go. And it worked and we started to close achievement gaps. And it's a really great idea until this. You're out one morning and you're getting your newspaper, you're at the end of your driveway and your neighbor waves. And she says, you got a minute. And you go over and she says, I just want to let you know my son, who has some real challenges at school, and I know that, has the best teachers he has ever had. And he was placed at another school that was really challenging. And I went in that day and I told my wife that story. She said, you know, that's really great to hear. I just don't think Katie's got as great of teachers as she had in the past. And I went and called the principal and said, what, what's going on there? He said, yeah, probably the teachers your daughter would have had last year. You know that program you set up? They went to those other schools. We got a little bit smaller pool. And it sounds like a great idea until you realize. Now, we continue to do it because it was the right thing to do. But what we realized very clearly was, you, it, you know, it, it, it's, it is an and or situation. You, know, you got to grow. You got to grow your total number of great people and create those environments where folks want to stay there from the start. In, in the end, we, we used a weighted student uh, staffing formula. And in our, 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 our most highly funded urban school in real dollars in an elementary, we were spending about 12,200 in my last year there. And in one of our um, highest performing schools, we were spending about $4,200 per pupil because we redirected dollars. We probably could have gotten a lot of credit in some communities if we talked about that, our weighted student staffing program. We never talked about it. Because if we did, I think it would have ended. And it was the right thing to do. And it benefited kids but unfortunately, in some cases, it took those star folks away from some other kids who really needed it. But we made the decision that we needed them in other places because of uh, years and years in a history of underserving children. Yeah, Irma, would you like to respond to this one, or should yeah, I? Yeah, sure. On? And um, then you, you guys be thinking of your questions, okay? Because we're going to we're going to take a couple audience questions. So here. Uh, a quick scenario: um, District 10 situation. Um, I had. We had a middle school that was going to be built in the district in our Kingsbridge Marble Hill area. And uh, the students uh, who were going to be zoned for that school were attending a school in Riverdale, which, was, uh, which is an affluent uh, parents who are very um, involved in their children's education, et cetera. And the parents came up with a proposal that they wanted to convert the Riverdale school, uh, the middle school, into a 6 through 12 school, uh, which meant that the implications for that was that then they would displace many of the Marble Hill students and that the Marble Hill students would then go to the middle school, the newly constructed middle school, but would not have the uh, same opportunities to be able to go into a 6 through 12 school. Um, it became uh, a real debate issue within our community. It actually divided um, that, the two parts of the community. Um, the sitting board members um, were against the proposal. Um, then came a school board election, and guess what? The Riverdale contingency um, won, and they were very much in favor of the proposal. And so here I was trying to navigate this very difficult um, situation which really called to my sense of both equity and access and what I wanted for all of the children in the district and my need to be responsive to the needs of both communities and to have them understand that I was both listening um, and that um, that the agreements that we were going to come to were going to be agreements that were going to be good for all kids. 
eventually, I made a proposal to the school board that we actually change the designation of the newly constructed middle school and actually build a six through 12 uh, school. Um, and uh, eventually what happened was that there were also some school uh, seats for choice from either students of either community to be able to attend either one of those schools. Um, obviously, I'm saying this in two minutes. Um, it took a lot of uh, energy on my part and resiliency because um, in many ways um, I had to do I had to be involved in communication political um, talking at um, understanding the political landscape and how to navigate that political landscape um, and both communicating with parents with elected officials with the press um, and being able to also bring my board together to come to a resolution that was good for uh, the district. Uh, and I think that when we were talking about preparation programs and how do we prepare individuals for situations like these, it's, it's, it's about creating opportunities for those individuals to actually engage in decision making. Um, I know that at the academy, we actually go through a six-week simulation, and we actually place them in the position of principal. And they begin to make decisions day one. And what they need to understand is that the decision that they're making is not the decision for the now, but it's the decision for the future. And that there are repercussions or there are unintended consequences when one makes a decision that is not really thought out and uh, well thought out. And so um, I think that through the preparation and giving uh, individuals opportunities to make decisions, to understand the ramifications, what they have to consider and think about and help them navigate uh, the decision-making process, that that helps to prepare them um, in addition to the, the, chat, the, the um, being with a mentor, the coaching that occurs during that process, et cetera. Yeah. The, the other thing I hear kind of in common in the stories here that you didn't say explicitly is it, it's almost, I think it's true in all three of them, you actually created a third option, that there was a choice to do this thing or that thing <coughs> that seemed really uh, either doable or that attractive, and by kind of putting some creativity to work, you kind of created, you expanded the opportunity set uh, to something that was perhaps both doable and also could bring bring people along, which I think is really interesting. So um, uh, the microphones, I think, are live and uh, ready for questions. So if you have a question, you can go to, go to a mic. They're standing here in the aisles. Um, and we'll, we'll take a, a couple. I'll stay at the mic when I ask another question in a minute, because we'll just, we'll just keep moving along. Yes, sir. Um, Fred Fantini, uh, 30 year member of the Cambridge School Committee. Just three, three quick questions. Uh, can you be a 40 hour a week leader and be successful? Uh, the second one is, and, uh, Biggest reason I'm getting uh, is that most leaders have a difficult time changing the culture. We've been doing this for 40 years, and it's not going to change. And so, uh, what, you know, how, how best can the leader deal with it? So we got one question. Which of those two would you like the? Would you like the? I know. I. 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 I you're, listen. You're getting warmed up. I didn't know how long your list was. I didn't know how long your list was, but I knew it was longer than two. So, so the two of the two that you've already um, put on the table, which would you like for the panel to the, take the a crack at? The one with the culture would be great. The one about the culture. Yeah. So, great. so is it is it possible, and how might you go about yes. shifting uh, shifting yes. the culture? And thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> That's my job. Um, so, Pete, how do you? Uh, well, this is like the holy grail, right? How do we change the culture? Um, such that it's easy to actually create the kinds of changes we want for kids and instruction. So, um, possible? If so, uh, what, give, what gives you hope about that? I want to be clear. We had a lot of really positive culture things that were going on. Um, the most powerful thing for me was modeling and being deeply engaged with our instructional leaders and that they knew I, I cared about instructional leadership, I was engaged, involved, and I was willing to make tough decisions fighting for them. And in modeling that, they were then willing to make the tough decisions, but then also along with modeling, though, came monitoring. Hmm. I felt you had to spend a fair bit of time doing things where, where you were out there with them and, and getting feedback and bouncing things around. 
And another piece too that I think helped us with the culture issues were just being honest when we did something wrong. And just, I screwed up. I cannot believe I told you principals to do this. That was the dumbest thing. <laughs> and we started to create this culture where we could be open and honest and we generally knew each other and liked each other and talked about the hard issues and worked on dealing with those pieces and focused on what was hard. And, and, and I'm kind of jumping all over here, I understand that, which is gonna make my last point um, not fit it. And that is, <laughs> we try to do things in alignment. What were we really trying to do and focus on? And, and we said, if we're gonna model these things, for, for example, we, we said things like, your master schedule is your most important tool you've got. Making sure that kids have the great teachers that they need and it's designed around kids' needs. I'll never forget the day when we went in and told the high schools, look, every coach can't have six period off. That's not great for kids. Let's do some things that, for example, where we start making our master schedule around Algebra one and English one first instead of making it around orchestra and German five. I've never met a kid in orchestra and German five who dropped out of school. It may have happened, but I've never seen that individual. So we just started to model some of those things. And then when the person came to the board meeting and tore me up over how could you tell these folks to do that, you just stay strong and stay true to what you do. But that modeling piece, I think, is so important in culture. The one thing that's missing, and um, Stacy, I'm, I'm not picking on you. The one thing that's missing <laughs> in all of the cases that have been written about Long Beach. Oh, I see. Is <laughs> the extent to which strengthening the research capacity of the district in many ways changed the culture. Um, so we hired. Uh, people from the Crest Center at UCLA who became our assistant to research and evaluation, Lynn Winters had the ability to make accountability teacher and principal friendly. And I've, it's rare when you see that in a large urban district. And I think that more than anything else changed the culture, the receptivity to data, what it was telling us, all of those types of things that sometimes can be like nails on a chalkboard uh, for teachers and others. All of a sudden there was this, you know what, here's where we are, but we actually know how to work with you to get you to a place where you can actually intervene with students in ways that you can get better out. So high expectations and a lot of data, but also <coughs> high support. Yeah. So once we know where we're struggling, the district built the capacity to actually uh, be able to provide some, some support so it didn't feel like people were just getting be beaten over the head yep. with uh, data. D did you have something quickly, just, Norman? Um, I'll take another one. Go ahead. You sure? Yep. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, my question kind of goes to the idea of feedback loops and in instructional leadership. There seems to be a large push, maybe not a push, but a lot of inexperienced people coming into instructional leadership positions recently, whether it's principal or superintendents. People who've never been in the classroom or their classroom experience is very minimal. Can you just talk generally about how you might train an instructional leader who has never really been a good instructor? Would you even try to do that? Norman? No, I wouldn't try to do that. So um, it's it's very it's 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 even more complicated than that because these days you not only have to have been uh, you not only have to know instruction in order to be able to observe and give feedback on instruction, but um, more consistently now than ever before, you need to know the content of what's being taught so that you can give teachers feedback on how to go deeper. On, on, on questioning. And so it's very, 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 very challenging work. Um, and so people who've had no experience or who are bad teachers probably are not going to make it as uh, instructional leaders. Mm -hmm. And that really goes to the criteria for selection of individuals into preparation programs. Um, the understanding that uh, key to that 
uh, interview process and has to be whether these individuals are instructional leaders, whether they understand how to give feedback, whether they can take a piece of student work and talk to you about it and what they're seeing and um, or how they're going to work with the teacher around addressing the needs of the students. Um, and so I think that's where the burden with preparation programs is to make sure that they select uh, the right individuals because I think you can then uh, really work with them in getting them to be better um, at giving feedback because sometimes that's the hard part. How do you give feedback? Sometimes you're a very good instruction, you know, good teacher, but um, you need to learn the skill of how do you give feedback to an individual for growth. Um, and, and, and sometimes a challenge because some principals um, are uh, not able to do that, are not able to look at what are the, the levers that are really going to help support um, the learning of a particular student um, and that they can help a teacher to do that. And, and are your two answers the same speaking to K-8 versus high school? Like is it the same, is it the same, or I gotta be a great uh, uh, oh, a leader I, of instruction, yes. understand deep Mine instruction is. at the high school? I will say two more optimistic things than what I said before. Um, one is, um, I'm not gonna know one is that it is possible to be a great teacher without a ton of experience. I've seen amazing teachers with very little experience, and it is also really possible if the the uh, the principal, the instructional leader, has the right mindset to coach and teach the ability to uh, observe and give feedback to teachers. Mm -hmm. You're, but the K-12, same same K-5, K-8, K-12. Um, Expect the same from high school principals across many, many content areas, many, many it's, methodologies. It's, it's, it's both. It's, it's really hard in both levels because, okay. you, I mean, you have a wider range of subjects in high school, but getting reading right and early math right is also, like, really uh, pretty, pretty freaking important also. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like there are, is a generalizable set of skills about observing, getting fee giving feedback, organizing others to observe and give feedback, just some, some general skills. We, we separated out high schools and decided we couldn't properly answer the question, so we came up with co-principals. That high was the level. way yeah. we ensured that instruction was going to be paid attention to in a 4,000 student high school. Yeah, yeah. One more and then I'm gonna ask a question. Hi. But everybody stay at the mics, because we'll come back. Uh, Hello, my name is Rena. I'm a master's student here. Um, I am also a teacher of teachers, elementary teachers, and I was an elementary teacher myself in New York City. Um, and I am really fascinated by this concept of the creation of space. Um, Pete Gorman and Norman Atkins, both of you literally said the words creating space. Um, it was, I created space to focus on something else that maybe I didn't want to focus on. And Norman, you mentioned how um, by practicing and rehearsing, it offers more space to, to be innovative. And I'm thinking to my experience as an elementary teacher, and I was often inundated with all kinds of things that I needed to do. Um, I loved inquiry learning. Um, I, I loved the curriculum that I had, but there was just no way that in the hours in the day I had, I could do it all. So I have two questions. It's a two-part question. One is... One question. Well, okay. <laughs> One question. <laughs> No, just ask the one. The one question <laughs> is, um, what does that concretely look like to create space? Yeah, it's a good one. Thank you. Like, what does that mean? You know, how do you do that? Space kind of means time and cover. And yeah, this, right is, this is like a way of, of the, the Boston School Committee guy was asking whether you can be a successful leader in a 40-hour week. I'd say it's probably a 50-hour week. Um, um, and that you can. You, when I was talking about creating space, I meant you get, um, you get really good, you practice and get really good at the core parts of your job, and that when you get in that particular habit, um, when you're in that particular flow or, or that rhythm, and you, and you concentrate on those narrow things, in this particular case, I was talking about instructional leadership, it opens up the the headspace, the, sort of the research on creativity is it opens up the opportunity then for you to mm. be able to process new things. Um, and the other, the other thing relatedly is that um, you can't innovate very well in silos. 
So that space can't just be your own head, but you need to find an opportunity to be working uh, with other colleagues. And um, if 90% is fixed, then the room to really explore around the 10% is pretty pretty exciting. Mm. I do want to stress, though, the, the part about the space that's your own to be reflective. Um, because I think that's the, the part of the work that we generally don't do, reflect on what we've done and whether it's been effective or not, why did we make the decisions, what were the factors, what would we do differently, and yes, have dialogues with your colleagues, but sometimes just sitting back and thinking through um, what behaviors or what pushed you um, to make the decisions that you made and what would you change as a result? Yeah, I think we're talking, both those are great, and I, I think we're talking about time too, right, yeah. in, in addition to kind of the practice of yes. reflection and conversation and, you know, all the, um, probably same as it ever was that mm -hmm. uh, surveys of teachers about what they wish were different about their context is that they wish they had uh, more time and this seems to be an, kind of an ongoing uh, struggle to create not just space to think, but actually time to reflect and, and to work uh, with colleagues. Um, so I have a, a, a question um, uh, about failure. So Pete, you mentioned, <laughs> let's really lift the, <laughs> let's talk about failure. Um, Pete, you mentioned that there were these, this aspect of culture building in Charlotte Mecklenburg that was about you owning up to mm -hmm. bad choices or, you know, uh, yeah, bad choices. Yeah, I did some stupid stuff. Um, and you having dumb, dumb, to ask, ask people to do things that were just the wrong thing to do. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in this, um, and I, you know, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. How do you prepare people in advance to be, um, or can you prepare people in advance to understand that struggle and learning from your mistakes is a big part of learning in general and for sure of improving your leadership practice, particularly in the high kinds of high profile and, and semi-public um, uh, leadership roles that system leaders have. Um, and so my, my, what I'd really love to hear is about a time that you failed, uh, what you learned from it, um, and how you help others both learn from that failure of yours and to kind of embrace their own um, mistakes and failures as learning, and in particular, in the difficult context of public education where everything matters, everything's supposed to work, uh, and someone can get just pilloried for even owning up to not having uh, made a perfect choice. So how do, I mean, you guys are on the front lines and have been for a while. Like, how do you, uh, how do you deal with that for yourself, and can we prepare aspiring leaders to know that that's coming and, and how to deal with it effectively? Well, I think our most noteworthy failure, <clears throat> we came up with this great idea to end social promotion in Long Beach. Multiple F eighth graders would not go on to high school. And people, you know, have thoughts about retention and that sort of thing. And this was supposed to be a genuine intervention. We had 750 multiple F eighth graders. <clears throat> and we actually took them and put them all together in the same school. Now, most thoughtful people think, my God, <laughs> that is one of the dumbest things I have ever heard. But we did it. We did it, and it failed, <laughs> and we learned a huge lesson. And, and I think... People, uh, Carl, were people telling you not to do it? When people you said, well, were hey, telling guess us what we're not to do. do it, but we ran into a NIMBY neighborhood that didn't want this school with multiple F eighth graders in it. And so I sort of took it personal. And, you know, I was trained as a counselor, pretty good listener, but in this instance, I was like, I'm going to roll over these folks. I'm putting that school there. And if, you know, if I have to have the state of California and all law enforcement, I'm doing this. And, and in hindsight, um, it was a mistake. <laughs> we, 
everybody, including me, was out there <laughs> trying to hold that school together with multiple F eighth graders. Mm -hmm. The idea, the idea was actually a good one. Let's not constantly send youngsters from one level to the next. And, and part of the way I sold it to the community, I actually talked about chairing adult school accreditations at two prisons in California and how, you know, there's nothing more sobering than a superintendent walking into a prison. Just like any other accreditation, you meet with the warden on the first day, you talk about things like how much does it cost to keep inmates here, all that sort of thing. But when we actually interacted as an accreditation team with the inmates, almost all of them talked about being passed on through the school system, ill-prepared but moved from level to level. So the idea of an intervention that would actually rescue kids was a good one, but I let my ego, I'm not going to let this NIMBY neighborhood run over us, and, and it was a mistake. We ended up, after two years, moving it to satellites at the high school campus where it worked much better. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a mistake. I wrote about it, school administrator, summer of 1998. So you've actually published about this it's, bill. Yeah, that's it's, true. it's out there. That's I've got one that's kind of Harvard related. Um, Harvard related. Yeah. Okay. Um, we we got deeply involved in um, working with Harvard through the Strategic Data Project, Strategic Data Fellows, and Data Wise, and we built data teams, and we were really doing good work with that. And it was driving us to do things like rewrite the master schedule so you did have all algebra teachers with the same planning periods. So they could look at data, but also we could That's move good. kids during the, the class periods to mm. have kids together working. And so we were really doing great work with data. And um, this guy on our team, Jonathan Raymond, was talking to me about this yeah, yeah, great superintendent. Um, he was our chief of accountability. The, this uh, cycle of continuous improvement that it's about having um, support and some pressure and then transparency to the information. And one day, a, a fellow, Andy Baxter, who I know Tom and some others know, he was a strategic data fellow for us, and he came into my office right before I'm about to go into a board meeting. And he said, I, I just ran this new scatter plot I really think you need to see. And um, it, it had um, two scatter plots on it, and one was, um, student academic performance by teacher using value-added methodology, and then teacher salary. And it was a scatter plot. And he came in, and I said, well, that's interesting. I said, what's that other one? He said, it's a randomly generated scatter plot. Can you tell me which one is which? And I said, no. And he said, yeah, in, in, in Charlotte, if you're looking at just one factor, student academic performance over multiple years, looking at value added based by teacher, and then compare it to uh, the compensation, which is based on years of experience, graduate degrees, et cetera. But there's, you can't pick which one's fake and which one's real. And I thought, well, this is an interesting thing. And we were on our way into a budget uh, workshop with the board. And I thought, I'm just going to show this to the board to show them about the debt. It was just stupid. <laughs> so I showed it to the board. And at that meeting, <laughs> Carl. <laughs> what came out of that was that we were going to balance the budget by going after the pay scale and converting yeah, to a pay for performance great. format that would start every. It, that, I just thought, well, this was fascinating. This was nifty. And what I learned was who you are and what data you have, you have to be careful because it would have been a completely different message if it was done at a different time, posed by someone else, couched in the right methodology. And I knew it was what, when you gave me these questions, we got some of these questions to think about in advance, and I called another friend of mine, a guy named Robert Avosa, who's very bright, he's superintendent of Fulton County, he used to be on our team. And I said, Robert, I'm supposed to tell about one thing stupid. He said, scatter plot, scatter plot. <laughs> I thought, well, that was pretty damn stupid. Yeah, oh, I, I should do that one. <laughs> and 
Uh, just to be clear, it set back a lot of our work a long yeah. way mm. because you're going through tough budget times in the first place and salaries have been froze, and you create a culture of fear just because you're jazzed at some new data. It was just stupid. So you guys are making me wish I had been an urban superintendent just so I could tell stories like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so how do you train people how do you, to Stacey's question, how do you train people to, uh, to deal with those situations and come up with a different outcome? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, one of the things that we have done when I talk to folks is just understand your position. And you are different, because I never thought myself, I was Pete. No, I, I was the superintendent. And when I made a comment or told somebody something, and I had to learn whether it was everything from walking down the hallway with my head down thinking and not say hi to someone, devalued that person to if I shared an insight tidbit with someone, the power they get from saying, you know, the superintendent told me and just had to learn that, and I share that with others, that you have to be very careful with what role you are in and how it can carry different challenges, but how others perceive that role. And um, the, the, the other piece too is I talk to folks, just think twice. Why, why the hell didn't I walk into our deputy superintendent's office and say, look at this, I'm thinking about sharing this. Because <laughs> it was a guy, Mo Green, he's now superintendent of Guilford County, and I'll never forget one day he told me, he's never called me Pete, he's a very formal guy, talks slow, he said, Dr. Gorman, I think you're trying to boil the ocean. We need to focus here. Focus here. <laughs> and, and I think he would have given me one of those, Dr. Right. Gorman. Yeah. We really need to rethink this issue. Yeah. So just don't, don't let your enthusiasm yeah. for a certain thing get in the way. Yeah, and I think that the way you, you get at it in terms of preparation programs is having um, them understand what are the unintended consequences of actions like that when you don't think them through. And I agree with you. I was reminded um, the principal, uh, the um, union, for principals, uh, the union leader would come to me and talk to me about what principals were thinking, and I would say, well, why don't they come directly to me? I mean, I have an open door. He says, you don't understand the power of the superintendency, you know, and, and, and it's something that you need to be reminded when you're in positions like that, um, and give uh, the aspiring uh, systems leaders the opportunity to engage in scenarios like that that help and push them to sort of think through, look at what happened here, look at the consequences of those actions. And, and especially with high stakes situations yeah. like board meetings where you have to learn to be prepared and develop agendas that you really have all of the backup information, et cetera. Yeah, another thing that I heard in, in Carl's story, the thing, one thing that resonates with, me, resonates with me is the ego thing. The more people start push back, the more uh, determined you get. And some of us are just wired up that way. Um, and have to survive as leaders sometimes pushing through. But the other thing I heard, Carl, that I thought was really interesting is you might have been able to hear the feedback you needed to hear about perhaps this wasn't the best of ideas if it had been a different messen messenger or group of messengers that you naturally respected. Yep. So that wasn't going to change, but as a leader, practicing listening through what you think of the group or the messenger and trying to get down into what the real insight might be, even though you might agree with them on nothing else. Just listening hard, even with groups that you disagree with, because it actually might be the case that they're right on this one, even if they've never been right uh, about anything before. It's a, it's a hard thing, it's a hard thing. Yes? I'm Jaime Aquino with New Leaders, so thank you for, for being here. You all reference how difficult the job of being a superintendent, particularly in urban, in urban districts, and obviously we can see how many uh, great superintendents trying to do the right thing to lift children out of poverty get burned. So given that, given that reality, plus the context that among the member district of the Council of Great City Schools, only 11% of the sitting superintendents are Latino. What can we do to recruit talented Latino to go into the superintendent because we are shying away 
given the reality that I just described and the fact that, Pete, you describe about the inward facing and the out, outward facing, but the reality for a lot of, of Latino is that there are at a disadvantage, even though we have come a long way as a country, uh, still with the outward facing because you can have Superintendent uh, Gorman and Superintendent Aquino doing outward facing and it is a different totally different reality, even though we are in, in 2014. Even within the funding community and the support that a Latino and probably African American superintendent gets, is so what can we do as a country to both change the reality, to really attract amazing talent. I know incredible educators who are shying away for uh, being superintendent, <coughs> particularly for uh, people of color and Latino who's now the largest minority group in the yeah, country. Yeah, if you guys would reflect on that, it's the recruiting challenge, and then also just the realities of um, uh, who you are and your identity having um, some effect on how the rest of the world responds to you in leadership roles and, and what what kinds of things we might do about that. Or we start us off on yeah, that one? Um, love to hear what people it are actually thinking. brings back me, it brings me back to the 1990s uh, when I was a principal and I was asked, uh, we were looking at New York City demographics and what they were showing was that in districts that were high minority, there were very few minority principals in those, in those uh, districts. And so I was asked to join um, an advisory committee at Bank Street to develop a principal's institute. Roll the clock back uh, to uh, 10 years later and um, the Leadership Academy was actually uh, developed and formed and started because of this lack of leadership but also lack of representation of minority leaders. And so part of the, and even as a district superintendent, you know, for me that became really important to make sure that there was really representation um, but that there was a pipeline and that there was a way of developing leadership um, that reflected the community. Uh, and. And so I think that in all those instances, it was about uh, being deliberate, having a focus and a goal, and then um, making sure that you could access. Um, I remember a principal in District 10 once saying to me, and this was at another level, this was at a school board level, uh, saying to me, gee, we would support, and this was when it was very political, we would support a minority candidate, but there aren't any. Um, that we could find that are eligible to do this work. And it's the same mentality around what occurred for it really trying to recruit per, uh, people for leadership roles as assistant principals, principals, et cetera. They were actually very talented teachers, but the opportunities to develop them, to give them access to preparation, et cetera, was just not there, and they weren't focused on as talent. So it's really a whole issue around talent development, talent focus. Um, and in, I know that we actually have one of our um, measures of effectiveness is the percentage of minorities that we recruit in our leadership preparation program. And uh, in the district, in our pipeline, we also made a very deliberate attempt to make sure that we had that mix. Mm -hmm. yeah. Others on this one? Yeah. I think you have to be fairly <coughs> ruthless um, on this score. Um, so I teach a course at Claremont called Strategic Management of Human Capital. And it's designed to just destroy everybody's thinking about traditional HR operations. And part of it is that this notion that often pervades traditional school systems that everybody needs to sit in the same chairs and you need to spend time it, cooling people out and it's absolutely the worst possible um, thing to do because really talented people don't want to be cooled out. Mm -hmm. They actually want those opportunities. And so I, I think um, you've got to get rid of all of those things that don't give you as the leader the opportunity to appoint emerging talent that's representative of the students and community that you serve. Yeah, this is just an ongoing and, challenge. And, and you get 
criticized. There's, that's just one of those areas where, my gosh, you know, what about all these people uh, who, quote, paid their dues, and you're jumping over them, and I just, I think that's one area where you just have to be as strong a leader as possible. Yeah. We, we just switch to more of an active format instead of passive, of counting on people to self-select and tap them on the shoulder to go into a leadership program. We just thought it was a really lousy strategy. So Waiting we, for people to say, oh, I want to be in that, yeah. versus going it, after talent. Or be lucky enough to go work for a building level yeah. leader who recognizes talent and chooses to take them under their wing, encourage them to do others, and offer those opportunities. So just as a two quick examples, one was we created an aspiring leaders program, which was one where we tapped bright teachers who had a great potential for leadership. We hired them in the summer and brought them into various departments within the district office to expose them to things. And we targeted our minority teachers as candidates for that, to expose them for that. And then um, when we had success with that, we created our own master's degree program where we paid for their master's degree and partnered with a local university. And we funneled those folks to that. So we were building our own pipeline of individuals for that that came with coaching and support and an internship and those types of activities. And we grew fairly fast in the number, not our overall percentage, because we started so far behind mm -hmm. that e even by adding 15 Latino administrators, we were still woefully low yeah. as a percentage. But it's getting better, getting better. And, so uh, I want to get one more question from the audience before we close up. Yes, ma'am. It'll be quick, but thank you. My name's Aliza. I'm a master's degree student here. And with regards to becoming a leader, what were your experiences or skills that you learned in your leadership preparation that served you the most throughout your career? I didn't have any leadership preparation. Well, I then feel just like, life. <laughs> I feel like... Um, I feel like this should be called becoming a leader, not being and becoming a leader. Um, always becoming. Because um, um, Emerson, who lived around here, would have <laughs> loved becoming as, a, <laughs> as an expression of this. So I, um, I, I, wish I, ha I, wish, I wish I could point to a specific uh, um, uh, program and, um, and set of skills for me. But what, I'm, what I look around and see so sort of just even thinking about this last question is, um, I feel like the last question we were just talking about what's at the downstream. And so for me, sort of going back to this issue of instruction, it's what I think we need to do nationally to improve education is improve teaching and instruction. And so we need to essentially, there are 42 out of 100 18-year-olds in America are thinking about going into teaching and going to work in schools, and that by the time they're seniors, it's only uh, uh, 10 in 100. Mm -hmm. And so we need to give kids, college kids, opportunities to experience what it's like to work in schools, and we need to build a whole talent trajectory and a whole set of experiences where to develop those education leaders at the, at the end, people have experience being good, solid teachers and deans and department chairs and emerging leaders. And uh, by that time, uh, folks will be uh, in the flow and uh, experienced and really good. And, uh, and that, that, I think, is the best preparation for being principals. And I really believe that to be a principal manager and to be a superintendent, you also have to have insight into instruction because superintendents and education leaders in this country need to be thinking every single day about what kids are learning in their classrooms. And so the best preparation for that is that entire stream of work. Yeah. Actually, I, I went through a preparation program and I could tell you that I learned absolutely nothing to prepare me for the job. Uh, when I became a principal in the 80s, I was thrown into the job and there was very little support. I think those are the things that actually helped me understand how important it was to be able to support leaders and the development of leaders. And I think the other part of all of this is that we're all learners. Um, and if you see yourself as a learner, then you develop as a result of experience. You dialogue, sharing, collaboration, et cetera by what you do right, what you do wrong. I mean, that, those are all learning experiences. 
but it also just pushes, it has always pushed me to know that um, professional development, support, um, opportunities to dialogue, collaborate, and to learn um, are really important so that you can build the skills necessary to be able to do the job. So let's do this. I'm going to do a closing question here that, that builds off of this one. So you didn't have any preparation to be a leader. You just started leading or <coughs> went through a prep program, learned nothing of value um, to, to becoming yeah. uh, a leader. How many um, in the audience are actually currently in either an undergraduate or graduate program here at Harvard or one of the local universities? Put your hands up. How many of, who's that in the audience? Okay, look at this, guys. So this is like, talk about the next generation of leaders. There, there are uh, a big number of them right here. So the exit question is, for all of those hands that just uh, went up, what's the one piece of leadership advice you would give them? You've got about 30 seconds each, okay? <laughs> The one piece of leadership advice you would just give that massive number of hands uh, for folks who are here trying to reflect on themselves and what it might mean to go back out into the world and, uh, and really lead. So what's that one piece could of I, advice? Could I suggest just one idea in addition to that question? No. Please. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's very we're important gonna, to everybody that raised their hand. We're, we're wrapping up. It's very Thank important you, to everybody that raised their hand. To, oh, to all the leaders that raised their That's hand? That's correct. I'm going to give you a hearing, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, how will the, the leaders preparing, uh, as this society is becoming more and more multicultural, how will the leaders preparing multicultural competency among the teachers? Okay, thank you for that. So exit question, the one piece of advice, all of these leaders, and if it's, it's on that topic, that's terrific. If it's not, that's okay too. Um, so that, that this group of leaders that raise their hands walks out with something from their graduate program that they can think back on and say that one time at that one panel, I heard this thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's, let's just go right down the line. I would argue that turning around urban schools and urban school systems is a long, hard slog. And that there's nothing more painful than watching this four-month trial that's unfolding in Atlanta um, right now. There really aren't any shortcuts. And so there's sometimes a conflict between this long, hard slog mm -hmm. and the sense of urgency about the rescue of kids who historically haven't been well served. And you have to figure out, okay, how can we move this needle but not get so caught up in the sense of urgency that we end up making incredibly foolish mistakes out of our belief that we gotta do this now. Long Beach, the really big gains in student achievement kicked in years five through 10 of my time there. Mm -hmm. Urgency tempered with patience yep. and integrity. For me, it'd be if you don't tell the truth to adults, you might be lying to kids, and that's unacceptable. When you go in and observe a class with the principal, and the instruction is of low quality, and you see it again and again and again at a site, you can't walk out of there and tell the principal, thanks for the great vit. You've got to tell the truth. And the, the team you work with knows whether you're telling the truth or not and it impacts your credibility every day, and I never want to work in an environment where I feel that I've ever lied to kids. That's great. Irma? Just to build off that, when you see a situation in a classroom that shouldn't be happening and you walk away from that, you're setting a standard. And that was something that someone had said to me um, and, and used that as a way of understanding where the bar was. Um, I want to add to that and say that um, one of the things that I've learned a lot is that when you're making tough decisions, you need to stay, step back. You need to really be reflective, consider all of the possibilities, look at the data, understand um, who the stakeholders are, try to understand all the points of views. But in the end, you have to be guided by what's best for kids, what your vision is, and then take a risk around making the best decision possible, understanding 
that you may need to remediate in between, et cetera, come back and examine it, and that um, you know, it's, it's a constant process of how do you tweak those decisions to be able to, to get to the goal that you want to accomplish, but that you need to be guided by your passion and your sense of what you want kids to be able to accomplish and do and be successful. I'll say three things. Um, go and make and become leaders of schools that are going to serve us for the next 100 years and not the past 100 years. Like prepare to be a leader for a new kind of school and help uh, invent that new kind of school. Secondly, if there's specific skills that you think you're going to need for your jobs, turn to other colleagues in your program and literally practice and rehearse those particular skills uh, uh, and, and, and role plays. And um, uh, third is um, make a lot of friends and create a culture of error where it's okay to talk about the kind of stories that we've heard today and, and, and learn from each other and uh, go forth and have fun. That's great advice. Thank you all so much. Let's thank our panelists. <laughs>